Hey, this is Travis. And in the past several videos, I went through how a user onboards into the Web3 ecosystem for the first time. And in the next several videos, I'm going to go more in depth on what is happening on the back end in order to make these processes possible, in order to enable Web3. talk about blockchains, peer-to-peer -peer networks, what that software architecture looks like, what is the software architecture of a decentralized app, and how does it compare to the Web2 apps that we use. But then uh, I'm going to start here at what is happening when you create a Web3 wallet. It is randomly generating this address for you, and I want to talk about what is happening there. Now, this is going to be kind of a scary topic for some people because we're going to talk about cryptography and it's very complex in uh, some cases. And so we're going to keep it at a high level and, and just try to basically understand uh, what a Web3 wallet is and how these wallets are derived. So the first confusing point here is that a Web3 wallet, when you want to create one, you are essentially guessing a random number between one and 10 to the 77. This is what 10 to the 77 looks like. This is how you call it, and I'm not gonna even try that. And it's a 78 digit number. So it's this enormous number, and the range of Ethereum addresses is one to 10 to the 77. And to create an Ethereum address and a private key and a public key, you are starting by, yeah, you're guessing a number between that range in order to come up with your private key right here. That is really confusing because people who have access to your private key have access to your crypto. And so you wonder, well, what's protecting the crypto if you can just, if somebody could just randomly guess that number? And the explanation for that is that this number is so big that even if you had a computer guessing every second of the day millions of private keys, the probability that it collides with your Ethereum address or anyone else's Ethereum address for that matter is super, super small. So the power of cryptography is not that it makes things impossible. Technically, it's possible that somebody could randomly guess your private key, but it's that it's so improbable that uh, we can model out the probability and say that a computer, it would take a computer um, thousands or millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years to guess that exact Ethereum address. So it's so improbable that it, we can basically ignore it. Um, so that's the first really strange thing about Web3 you're randomly generating a password and account in cyberspace. It's very different from how you create a, an address and a password with your Web2 service provider like Facebook, Instagram, and all that. You uh, set your email as your username and you set a password. The difference is obviously that this company like Facebook is storing your username and password and they have complete access and control over your account and they can ban you from using your account and all that. They could delete your account, delete your data, all of that stuff. With Web3, you're creating this address out of nowhere that the, the universe of addresses is so large that no one else will come across it. So this is how you do decentralized account management is through some crazy cryptography like this. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail here, but understand that because we end up with your Web3 wallet, we end up here at this address. Let's go to account one, two, one, one, six, two, one, one, six, right? So through elliptic curve cryptography, this is pretty complex. If you want to get into it, you can study more on it, but I'm not going to cover it in this video. You're, you can derive your public key from your private key through elliptic curve cryptography. This is also known as pro, or public key cryptography right here. So a private public key pair, they're paired together, they're intimately tied together. 
you can go from private key to public key, but you can never go from public key back to private key. And this is the asymmetric power of public key cryptography. But just understand that they're a pair and they are intimately linked with one another. And then you can also do something called hash. You can hash this public key to derive your Ethereum address. And um, you'll see that all different blockchains, they have different address conventions. Ethereum has 0x always as the starting digits. And then uh, they go on from here. And other blockchains like Solana, Polkadot, they're going to have other address conventions. Maybe it's a different number of digits or the first two letters that are appended on there are different. But um, yeah, basically your address is derived from your private key. Okay. These are all intimately tied together. And it's important to say that you cannot go back on any of these steps. You can only go one direction. These are called one way functions. You can only go from left to right. You can never go from right back to left. And this is why you're able to share your public key and Ethereum address with anybody because they can never derive your private key from that. So this is an Ethereum wallet. This is this Ethereum wallet right here. I have 0.0003 ETH and 2.81 DAI in here. And this is what's controlling it. If somebody had my private key, then they could uh, take all of this crypto from me. Cool. So this is a Web3 wallet. Now, you might be wondering at this point, if you saw the last video or the video where I created the Web3 wallet, that it generated a 12 word mnemonic phrase right here. So now I'm going to relate the two. How does the mnemonic relate to this private key that I'm showing you right now? Well, the mnemonic, well, first it comes up with some source of randomness. They call it entropy. It randomly generates a number. It puts that number through an algorithm to create a mnemonic passphrase. And you can go into more detail on how this is done if you're interested in that algorithm and, and going deeper into cryptography. Uh, look into BIP39 uh, mnemonic derivation, something like that. Google something like that, and you'll be able to find that step-by-step -step process. Also, another really good book is Mastering Ethereum by Andreas Antonopoulos or something. I probably pronounced that guy's name wrong. Anyway, this mnemonic passphrase can get passed through another algorithm. It's just, uh, it's this uh, publicly published algorithm, so anyone can do it or implement it in code to take these 12 words and then re recombine them or regenerate them into a way where it creates a number. And that's your private key. So you can derive through this 12 word phrase, this private key again, and then you can go through this process that again, elliptic curve and hash function, these are all publicly published algorithms and you can get to the Ethereum address here. Now, the cool thing about the mnemonic phrase is that it actually is a you can use this algorithm to generate multiple private keys and you can create multiple sub accounts within your wallet. So you, you can see here that I actually have already created multiple accounts. I have account two with eight ending in 8284. Look, this second address ends in 8284. Account three ends in 61F7, 61F7 right here, right? So this mnemonic phrase is being used to generate these they call them paths uh, underneath the wallet. So a mnemonic phrase, and then you've got all these sub accounts and you can send crypto to each of the, each one of those accounts. This is awesome from a UX perspective because instead of making people keep track of all these individual private keys or even memorize these 78 digit numbers and write them down. And um, I mean, like what's the odds that you misspell something when you're copying a 78 digit number onto paper pretty high but you really decrease those odds when you show people a 12 word phrase made up of words that are in common parlance this is these are words that we see very often all that you have to do is memorize the order of these 12 words and you can regenerate all of these wallets and regain access to all of these accounts so this is this bip 39 which is the this entire process is really good from a UX perspective. I want to show you now if I um, I'm just going to show you 
on a UI how this works, like how all this is derived. What I'm going to do is grab this um, wallet's secret phrase, which we actually already have right here. So this is the 12-word secret phrase. I'm going to put it into here. Here's the secret phrase, and now actually it probably wants 12 words there. Okay. Now I can go all the way down here, and here are all my addresses that this mnemonic phrase recovers. So yeah, here are the wallets, 2116-8284-61F7. So this last, this fourth address that I have in here should be FC117. Let me create an account. Let me create another account right here. And I'm expecting the last four digits to be C117. Account four, last four digits, C117. Boom. Awesome. So that is how, that is what a Web3 wallet is at a very fundamental cryptographic level. It's just 78 digit number private keys. And it's a file that stores these private keys. When I delete my MetaMask from this computer, that key store gets wiped out and I'm gonna have to come back in with my 12 word recovery phrase to recover all of these accounts in here. Um, that's pretty cool and hopefully I kept it at a high enough level so that you can uh, understand it and not get too bored by these explanations. I think it is good to build these mental models so you can understand what is actually happening on the back end. Now to continue, um, in the next video, we're gonna go over actually what is a peer-to-peer -peer blockchain network. I'm gonna show you what that software architecture looks like and compare it with what is happening in the centralized Web2 world right now and how, that, how they are different from one another. Thank you guys.